Hey, it's Lucas Livingston, the creator and host of the Ancient Art Podcast, bringing you another exciting episode of the series Uncorked from Archaeology Now. In this episode, we're popping the top off the beers of Egypt and Mesopotamia. Previously in the series, we explored how our modern classifications like beer and wine and mead don't always easily apply in antiquity. But here I'm going to focus on the fermented grain-based beverage of Egypt and Mesopotamia, more broadly the whole ancient Near East, which if you had a sip of it today, you might well call it beer. Beer was a, a daily staple for people from all walks of life, and quite literally like, like liquid bread. Ancient beer was a, a vital source of nutrition, the backbone of commerce, and integral to the fabric of culture and community, even well before the invention of writing. Excavations of prehistoric sites across ancient Egypt and the ancient Near East reveal evidence of large-scale municipal breweries. In the first episode of Uncorked, we already mentioned the ancient breweries of Gobekli Tepe in modern Turkey. At the ancient Egyptian site of Hierakonpolis from around the 4th millennium BC, large ceramic vats function similarly to our modern mash tuns and brew kettles. Analysis of the thick residue clinging to these vessels revealed a recipe of of mostly crushed and malted emmer wheat, plus some barley and traces of fruit. And so over 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians seemed to be enjoying a, a fruity wheat beer. While we can learn a lot from the archaeological remains, it's a lot like flipping to the page in the middle of a book. You can only learn part of the story. And we want to look at the evidence like the written record. What's clear is that beer was in no short supply across ancient Egypt and the ancient Near East by the time of the historical period when we see the advent of writing, because beer's all over the page, so to speak. A lot of information about beer in Mesopotamia trickles in on pretty mundane documents like receipts and inventories inscribed in cuneiform on small clay tablets. Uh, and we learn that the popular Sumerian word for beer was cash. No, this cash is a totally different word. We also learn about different strengths and styles, like golden, dark, sweet, and red. There's a lot of variation in the beers of the ancient world. It's important to remember that we're talking about many different cultures over thousands of years, encompassing millions of square kilometers. Don't think of Mesopotamia, or even ancient Egypt for that matter, as cultural monoliths. In ancient Egypt, beer wasn't only a necessary staple in life, but also in the afterlife, because in ancient Egypt, yes, you could take it with you. Just about any ancient Egyptian who could afford it would be buried with the basic survival kit of bread and beer, or in Egyptian, ta and henket. Does that ring a bell for any craft beer aficionados? And the more hoity-toity who had some money to drop on their funerals would ensure an eternal supply of the good stuff in the afterlife by literally inscribing it in stone and furnishing their tombs with model figurines of brewers. A truly remarkable Sumerian document, the Hymn to Ninkasi from around 1800 BC, gives us a glimpse into the ancient Mesopotamian brewing process. As the name suggests, this was a, a hymn, uh, a psalm, a, a poetic prayer to Ninkasi, the goddess of beer. And how better a devotion to the goddess of beer than by brewing her drink? So while the Hymn to Ninkasi is not literally a, a step-by-step -step cookbook, uh, much of the hymn relates some familiar actions in the brewing process, you know, from malting and mashing to fermenting and filtering. Uh, one big difference from the modern brewing practice, though, is that there are no hops. The hops don't make an appearance until about the European Middle Ages. There's also mention of some sort of sweet substance, probably date syrup, perhaps to help along fermentation and boost the alcohol level. Another interesting feature of Mesopotamian brewing is the use of something called bapir, which was a likely lightly baked loaf of bread. Uh, loaves of bapir would be crumbled into the unfermented beer. And there's all kinds of speculation about the purpose of bapir. A popular theory is that it was lightly baked such that it was still doughy on the inside with active yeast. So it functioned something like a, a scoby or a sourdough starter to inoculate the brew with yeast. 
the big question is, what did any of these ancient beers taste like? Well, my somewhat facetious rule of thumb is that any beer before the Industrial Revolution was flat, room temperature, hazy, smoky, and tart. Everything you wouldn't want in a beer. Or could that perfectly describe the rebellion to tradition that today's craft brewers strive for? That rule of thumb being said, one thing we do know is that ancient Egyptians enjoyed a cold one. In a complaint from the New Kingdom against some robbers who had stolen some food and drink, the plaintiff states, They drew a bottle of beer, which was cooling in water, while I stayed in my father's room. There have been a, a handful of commercial attempts in recent decades to reconstruct ancient Egyptian and Near Eastern beer. All these experiments are a little bit like Jurassic Park, though, filling in the blanks with modern DNA. And we don't have anything like beer advocate from the ancient world. The only thoughtful attempts to describe these ancient beers come from much later Greco-Roman authors. Diodorus Siculus mentions a drink made out of barley and called by some Zuthos, the bouquet of which is not inferior to that of wine. That's high praise for a Greco-Roman author. Probably one of the most intriguing aspects of beer culture from Mesopotamia was that beer was drunk through a straw. Countless cylinder seals and relief carvings depict men and women equally gathered around, seated with long straws, dipping into large beer jars. Most of these straws were probably disposable hollow reeds, but we do have some metal straws that have survived all these eons buried in tombs with their owners. So why straws? Well, this is where we can debate, but one school of thought is that a straw would get you past that bitter, frothy yeast floating on the surface of a still actively fermenting beer, because beer didn't have a long shelf life. The straw would also help stay above the sediment and perhaps even help filter out chaff and any other debris in the beer. Another equally plausible explanation for the straw, though, is that beer was fundamentally a, a communal beverage, brewed in large quantities to nourish the entire family and community. A famous Sumerian cylinder seal from the tomb of Queen Pu'abi around 2600 BC shows revelers at the top drinking beer through long straws while enjoying most likely wine from dainty cups down below. And like gathering around the proverbial water cooler, straws would bring the community together to sit, relax, and enjoy conversation with friends and family. When it comes to beer culture, that's not changed. Beer's a beverage of the masses, a, a drink that brings people together. So maybe going back to the beginning of this episode, asking that question again, would you recognize it as beer if you had a sip of it today? Well, maybe it's not about the nuanced sensorial profile of the beverage. If you're knocking back a few with good company and good conversation, then yeah, you'd know you're drinking a beer. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you want to learn more about beer and wine in ancient Egypt, check out my Ancient Art Podcast, episodes 51 and 52 at ancientartpodcast.org. Be sure to keep tuning in to further episodes of Uncorked. Go back and watch the others if you haven't, and be sure to check out the other original video content from Archaeology Now. Click subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss a beat. I'm Lucas Livingston, and I'll see you next time.